Welcome to Make Things That Matter, the podcast where we explore impactful products and the cultures that create them. I'm your host, Andrew Scottsko, and if I'm doing my job well, each episode of this show will help you to do meaningful work, make things that make things better, and have a great experience doing it. Rob Walling is a serial entrepreneur and the internet godfather of indie SaaS businesses who has built six companies and has been a long-standing voice in creative, independent paths into product building and entrepreneurship. In fact, some of his earliest writing, which debuted online in roughly 2009 or 2010, helped influence my decision to pursue an entrepreneurial path. Rob sold his last startup in 2016, which was an email marketing automation tool called Drip, and he's since doubled down on helping indie makers find community through MicroConf and in helping establish a broader range of funding options for software founders who may want to raise some capital, but don't necessarily feel that the venture capital-backed track is right for them. Rob is also a repeat guest, first appearing way back on episode 28, where we explored what success really means and finding your way to feeling like you have enough. The Kickstarter for his latest book, The SaaS Playbook, opened today, which is pretty cool since A, you don't see many Kickstarters for nonfiction books, and B, it's actually a really good book that will shave years off your learning curve if you want to build a SaaS. And in this conversation in particular, we dig in on when to trust your gut and how to increase your personal learning rate preventing burnout, managing your own psychology, and how to think about transitioning to building an independent business if you've ever thought about leaving a big software company and starting your own thing. So please enjoy Rob Walling. Rob, welcome back to the show. You were last here on episode 28, and uh, it's been quite a journey in your in your world and the world of Tiny Seed since then. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I was telling you offline, first I'm not busy, and then I'm busy, and then I'm not busy again. A lot has happened in, since uh, episode 28 in my world. Absolutely. So how is Tiny Seed going? I mean, you were, you were mentioning to me, you know, I don't know how many batches have gone through since you were last on the show, but it's got it. You, you probably have seen, what, at least a, a hundred other companies since we last spoke, something like that? Yes, so, something like that. We just sent out offers for batches 9 and 10. Uh, this should bring us to around 125 companies. It's somewhere in that range, maybe even 130. And then I have an additional like 20 f- something of my own angel investment. So yeah, the total is it's getting crazy. I mean, it's just totally surreal, you know, to, to be involved at that level with that many companies. And it gives me an interesting viewpoint that I'm not sure I've ever had in my life, right? Mm-hmm. Of like seeing this huge swath of what's working, what's not, and these things changing over time. But also it starts giving me confidence in my, I'll have an intuition, I'll give advice here's what I think you should do. And then it'll work or it won't. And I can refine that. I'm almost like I have a bunch of split tests going on, you know, in a way that like you can't when you only have one company. So it's fun. You had a whole career of building things directly yourself prior to Tiny Seed. How did you see the trajectory of your learning and your confidence in in your own ideas and your intuition? How, How fast did that accelerate once you started seeing, you know, another 20 reps every six months or something? A lot faster. Yeah, I I always <laughs> I tended to have confidence when I was a founder building stuff. I had confidence in my decision making ability of like I think I can make a good choice here. You know, I think I can be successful. I think I can ship. I think I can generally be good enough. But when I started to think about okay, now I'm going to put together a framework of how to think about product, market, marketing, hire, you know whatever, it was always mm-hmm. like do I have enough data <laughs> in my head to, you know, to have a framework around this? And that's what's changed for me is by the time we were about 30, 40 companies in, I was like, oh, yeah, there's a really obvious framework now of what, Mm. like building your team, for example. And I have this whole thing, you know, we'll talk about my book at some point, but I have this whole thing of like, if if you're a developer founder and you have a subject matter expert as your co-founder and you're in a high touch sales SaaS, then your first hire should probably be X. And Mm -hmm. if you're low touch, the first hire should probably be Y. And it's like, I wouldn't, I didn't have that knowledge five, Mm -hmm. 10 years ago without surveying, but I almost have this built in kind of qualitative data coming at me constantly. And it's helped me, helped me feel better about the frameworks and the strategies that I employ. Absolutely. One of the questions that I found coming up a lot recently in my coaching of founders and product leaders is it is about around decision making and in particular when we can trust our intuition. How do you think about that? And how do you coach the the founders you work with on that? Yeah. So the interesting thing is there are founders who their intuition is usually right. And there are some people where it's usually wrong. The thing that I'm still struggling to figure out is my gut feeling is that all of us, when we start out, are usually wrong. Most of us. 
and that it Makes truly sense. is a learning. It's a nature plus nurture thing, right? I remember being 25, inexperienced, 22, whatever. I could write some code, but like I didn't know anything else. So I was like trying to build a B2C two-sided marketplace, you know, what everybody else says. It's like, right, right. Yeah, you, haven't, you haven't learned anything. And then over time, like you get more reps, you get more experience, and you hang out with other people who are successful. And you realize, oh, they think really differently about X than I do. They th think differently about delegation or efficiency, or they just don't even bother with you know, certain things or whatever, like you start to see how they make decisions. And I think all of that influences your founder gut, right? I call it the founder gut. It's how, how well you make decisions. Um, certain people are more impulsive, obviously. And then I've seen people that are super calculated and like really taking a lot of data. I don't know that there's much difference across those two. I do think it's, it's a lot of seeing situations and being exposed to them and then almost being mentored, whether you're mentored vicariously, like imagine listening to hundreds of episodes of your podcast. I almost, I can improve my founder gut just by hearing you talk about things because you're smart and you probably make pretty good decisions. And so therefore I can like borrow from that or just osmo through osmosis, I can glean that. I've noticed the same thing. There's like, everyone has different learning approaches that work for them. For some people, it's you know, I, I watch content or I listen to content. Some people, it's like, I got to do it hands on. Others, it's shadowing, whether directly or vicariously. But I, I think you're so right in the sense that if you can accelerate your learning through other people, like, why would you pay for it all with your own time and experience? So it's like that, whether that's community or however you do it, it just makes a lot of sense. But yeah, the, uh, I guess one, one question that just to make this a little bit tactical for people, is there a pattern you notice with founders where they think they should be trusting their gut? But you're like on the outside, you're going like, oh, no, no, this is not this is not the time to trust your gut. And and is there a way have you noticed anything about when they really should not trust their gut? That's a good question there. I know people who their gut is just not good. And they kind of oh, I, the phrase I use is they're just constantly getting in their own way. Yeah. And they'll even go so far as to ask for advice. Ask me or ask kind of them in some private Slack groups. They'll ask the group and be like, I'm thinking about do I have three choices. I'm thinking about doing this one and the like the entire group experienced, successful entrepreneur said, that's the dumbest idea I've heard. This other one will work or even a fourth option that I'm coming up with. And the person still goes with the initial mm. one. And everyone's like, oh, here we go again. Mm. And that's, I think, the big mistake is, look, if if you, if what you're doing isn't working, your gut's probably off. That's the thing, right? If, right. if it's working and your company's growing or you're getting traction or everything's making sense, then your gut is probably pretty good. And if it's not, then the question is, well, how do you make your gut instinct better? And the way to do that is what we've just said. It's to learn from others. The best way, I think, is to be like one-on-one. -on -one. It's not always possible, but like I think of my my co-founder with Drip, which is my last SaaS app I built. He was like 23 and I was like 38 or something. So I had been, and I had way more experience, but he was an amazing developer. He came on every day. We talked about what do we build? How are we thinking about building it? How do we market? What do we think, right? I would, mm -hmm. and I wasn't even, it was truly osmosis. I wasn't like trying to teach him. He just saw how I made all the decisions and how mm. deliberate I was. And now he has his own startup called Savvy Cal that he's just crushing it at. And I think that was a big part of it. I'm not saying it was because of me, but I'm saying it's because he was a smart guy who then learned better decision making. And then one step removed from that is probably like being in a mastermind group, right? Or like a, mm -hmm. a you know, whatever, a brain trust, whatever you call mm -hmm. it, where it's like six or eight people who are successful and you glean. And then it's like a community. And then it's listening to books and audiobooks and podcasts, like each ring out of this kind of concentric circle, I think helps you to, to a different degree. I love what you're saying. It's one of the things that I have experienced myself. And I'm sure you've seen a lot with the tiny seed batches is, you know, this notion of founder whiplash, right? Where you just, yeah. as a founder, you just get so much advice, which on the one hand is great and it's well intentioned, but then you have this hard problem of like, who do I listen to? Yeah. That's well, and there's so I want to say two things there. Number one, a big thing about founders, I think, who have good founder gut is they have they know themselves. They know they have a real deep kind of introspection. And they're like, I know when I'm bullshitting myself mm. or I know when I'm out of my league. And even though most of my decisions work out, I need to get other people involved. And I'm going to ask advice of three or four hand picked people. I'm not going to go to Twitter and ask some poll. <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm going to talk to the most knowledgeable people in these areas that are going to tell me how they really think, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask my audience because they're going to tell me what I want to hear. So that's one thing is I think the people who I see stumbling with bad founder gut, they don't know themselves very well. Like they've never, the self-introspection of like, oh, I'm kind of a dummy about this yeah, stuff. Yeah. They don't realize that, right? 
So that's the first thing. And then the second thing, which is what you just brought up, is how do you know who to listen to? Well, I sure shit am not listening to Captain putting out YouTube videos about how easy it is to make money doing X, Y, Z. You know what I mean? It's like Mm -hmm. pundits on the Mm -hmm. internet. Like be really careful with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm super careful. I either have curated like a group of of friends, but I will go into the Tiny Seed Slack, which is a couple hundred founders and investors. And I will ask questions like I had to title my book and I had a bunch of different options for that. So I just like, I want to get feedback on it. Now, who should I listen to? I don't know. I had a gut feel of what I wanted to do. And I was curious the input and the feedback around it. But the Mm -hmm. more people you get involved, like, let's say I posted to Twitter instead, right? That's like 30,000 followers there. I have, which I have, it, it blands, it makes the, the results are more bland almost. You know what I mean? It evens them out. Sure. In a way that is, you're not going to be edgy per se. You're not going to make the risky decision. Then I think it's, it's the bell curve shifts. It's like it gets watered down as you have more and more people and particularly as as more and more of those people have basically no skin in the game, right, where they have uh, an asymmetric bias. It's like when someone t- wants you ask you for a feature request, which is all upside to them for you to do it would be, you know, a huge investment or something like that. And you're like, you don't if you don't think about that, you're like, oh, of course they want it, but they don't have to live with it. Right. They just they just want the upside. Right. right. Or when you get people using your product. And your pro- let's say your pro- <laughs> I was in this situation. I had a SaaS app called Drip, marketing automation platform. We were growing like crazy. It was the most successful startup I ever had. I sold it in 2016. It was it was great. It was the story of my life, right? Mm-hmm. But we were growing fast. We were shipping. People loved the product. We were just cleaning house with these venture fund against these venture funded uh, startups. And we would get people come in and start using it, and they would use it, and they would send us this 30 minute Loom video, and it's like, oh. Mm. I can't believe you're you, uh, like never use a button to do that. Well, obviously everyone knows that the paradigm, and I was just like, who the fuck are you, man? Like you have (laughs) none of this matters. None of it matters. Like what? And we, it would be people. I'm like, oh, they're some consultant. They've never built anything like that. You know what I mean? Like they, Mm -hmm. yes, they know what they're talking about in quotes, but like, this is another thing of like who to listen to. Yeah. A lot of opinionated people telling us the way we built features XYZ sucked and they should have been different and they should apply to their paradigm. And I was like, then go use something else, man, because we are doing just fine here. We're doing millions of dollars <laughs> bootstrapped. I actually don't need your opinion, right? But there's a balance because you can get hard. You can get a shell, right? You can become, uh, you know, the Hulk or whatever, where your yeah, skin is too, too armored thick. up. You don't take any feedback because you do need to take the feedback that matters, right? And that's the balance that's tough is like, how do I take the stuff I should listen to and then get rid of the the stuff from the people who shouldn't be talking? To me, it seems like another instance of the, of kind of the same decision process you go through when you get, you know, feature requests, for example, right? You're, mm-hmm. for, for example, like what I, I don't know how many times I've definitely long since lost count of the number of times I've coached somebody. I'm like, yes, that person has a feature request and that's not their job. That's your job to figure it out. Like their job is to be mm-hmm. an expert on what hurts. Your job is to figure mm-hmm. out what to do about it. Mm-hmm. You know, like maybe nothing, Yeah, which, which maybe nothing, nothing. Yeah. you know? Yeah, that's the thing. It's your product. You have the skin in the game and you have to weigh the effort with the potential upside. And that's often hard back to like founder gut. It's like, cool. So I get this feature request. It's reasonable. I could see someone needing that. Then the question is, so should we build it? And when should we build it? And mm-hmm. usually I would try to guesstimate. And I don't know how good these guesstimates were or not. They were right enough of the time because we were successful. But it was always like, I remember being like, I think like 10% of our user base would use this, right? I would just throw out a number and I'm like, what do you guys think? You know, Mm -hmm. what do y'all think people on my team? And that's kind of how I would make a decision, which sounds crazy. Like, well, didn't, couldn't you just survey and just get hard data? And it's like, no, a lot of making it, being a founder and and a product owner is making a lot of hard decisions with incomplete information. Like that is my mantra. I say that sentence all the time. And that's just what you have to do sometimes. We gather as much data as we can. But at some point, you do have to make a decision. You'll never be at 100% certainty. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So let's, we're going to get into, into the book a lot more. But I actually wanted it before we get into the content of the book, which is excellent. I've been through it already. And uh, obviously, as, as this is coming out, the book is just releasing on Kickstarter. So we're going to link to all that in the show notes. And if you're listening to this, please go check that out uh, and support Rob in this book launch so we can have a lot more good SaaS products in the world, not a bunch of like zombie crap ones. Um, but... I actually wanted to hear more about your process of, of doing this book. This is, I can't remember, is this book four or six for you? It's book four. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a, lot. a lot of book. I've heard they don't get easier. So what was hard about this one? Like, what was the struggle on this wanted one? wanted it to be easier. Oh yeah. my gosh, I wanted it to be easier. The hard part for me now is 
I feel like I have at, for this book, it was all in my head. I knew exactly what the book w- what mm. should be. I'd had all the content. I was just like, yes, I didn't have the time. Yeah. Right. I run two, I run microconf, which is like the original community for bootstrap SaaS. I run tiny seed, which is a, like a Y combinator, but for bootstrap SaaS, it's an accelerator. These are both companies with, you know, five plus team members on each. We've raised millions of dollars. Like it's, it's a busy life. And I put a YouTube video out every week and a podcast episode out every week, 52 weeks a year, right? So my life, and I have a family and all that. And your husband and father, yeah, you have have a life. Right, so there's stuff. So how do I write this book? I'm like, I know that I want to get this out and I was encouraged to to put it down. So I carved out some time. There was quiet time. And for about two months, I wrote every day. This is like almost two years ago now. Mm. And I got 20,000 words, which Mm. for me is about half of a book. My books are like 40 to 50,000. So they're like 200 pages. I want you to be able to Mm -hmm. read them on like a four hour flight, you know? So I stalled complete writer's block. I spent months, like four months Mm. showing up and being like, "Uh," and then I would like, well, maybe it's the outline. So I'd re-outline the whole book. Nope, that wasn't it. Maybe it's, everything should be a question. I can answer questions. So then I turned the whole outline into a series of questions. That didn't, that didn't do it. So then I was like, I need a writing coach. My wife had used a writing coach, which is someone who busts your chops, keeps you accountable, and also, frankly, helps you turn content you already have into chapters, right? Into mm-hmm. sections. Because mm-hmm. I have l- close to, a, I've been told I have like a million words. Someone scraped my podcast and YouTube and this and that. And they're like, you have more than a million words that I could use to train an AI, which mm-hmm. I actually think we should do. So then I can just have it outlined my, my <laughs> yeah. videos from now on. But so I have mil- let's just say I have a, a crap ton of words in the, in the ecosystem, right? especially SaaS, it's like, can't we just pull from that and, and make the book? So I hired a writing coach. They didn't work out. Hmm. Super discouraged. And it wasn't yeah. until, yeah, it was, it was, it was challenging. And I was like, I, maybe I'll just never finish this. Like mm-hmm. I'm kind of done. Then someone, I actually said this at a conference I was speaking at, at a microconf and someone came up who I knew. And he said, I know someone who's really good. She's a writing coach. She does some ghost writing and she'll crush it for you. He introduced me to her and that was it. So from there until it was done was about five months. Hmm, and it was wow. all, she's like, yep. And she kept saying, this section's great. She reordered stuff. And then she'd be like, and it's all my thoughts, right? Like she's not a SaaS person. She's a writer. She writes fiction and other stuff, but she was pulling it out of my brain. So we, she would interview me. I've never done this. So I have a real weirdness around it because I'm a, mm-hmm. I was a writer first mm-hmm. before all this, before I was a podcaster, before I was a founder, I wrote, I've been writing since I was a kid. So I really struggled at first with someone else writing for me. But yeah. in the end, it was like the book wouldn't have got done. And yeah. so now, so she would then write and then I'd rewrite it in my voice. And it was, mm. it was my thoughts that she would write in her voice and then I'd rewrite them in mine. So that was ultimately, uh, the solution and that I'm glad. And a- already now I have another book that's basically been written that we're like finishing up in the past like four months because there was so much stuff that didn't fit in the SAS playbook that was some earlier stage, I, you know, ideas and validation and this and that I didn't want in this book. And we just turned that it's like 40,000, 45,000 words. So now I'm like, huh. I think I might write a book every year now at this yeah. case because it's gotta, like if I can just process that works. Yeah, I have the ideas, right? I have the content, I have the knowledge and the experience at this point, but I don't have the time. And so that's that was a honestly a mental like each of us deals with maybe mental um, self limiting beliefs. I'm like I will never use a writing coach or a ghostwriter mm-hmm. because I'm a good writer, and it's mm-hmm. like yeah, but also maybe be realistic. And what do you value having a book out? Mm-hmm. Or having half a book all in your words. And that's mm-hmm. where I had to make the trade off. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's really, I really appreciate you sharing that because I think people look at authors like yourself or, or really anybody who's put out a book and they just think like, oh, it must be so easy for them. Like, you know, Rob's written online for a decade. Like he's written four books. You know, this is, he's got this thing down. But so to hear, hear you actually admit that, no, this was hard. This was a struggle. I think it's actually really encouraging for people that it's a different challenge, even when you've reached a, a different level or part of the game. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so talk about the Kickstarter. Like I, it's not very often you see a nonfiction book on a Kickstarter. So how'd you, that's uh, true. Yeah. What's up? What's up with that? Yeah. So there's two, there's a couple things speaking earlier. You're like, how do you make hard decisions? And it's like, yeah, one of this was a hard decision for me because every book that I've launched has been, you know, I have social presence and email lists and an audience. And I put up a, I used to put up a landing page with a couple buy it now buttons by the, just the this or the that plus audio package and mm-hmm. it's 30, it's 40, 50, whatever. And this time I realized, you know what? I want to learn something. I want to do something hard that's outside my comfort zone that I learn, whether it's successful or not. I don't mm-hmm. know. I Hopefully it will be. But there's a chance that although everyone's heard of Kickstarter in my audience, I've already getting emails of like, yeah, I just don't want the cognitive load of like signing up for another uh, 
you know, account. So I'm not going to back your Kickstarter. I'm like, oh, huh, maybe I made the wrong choice, but we'll see. Hmm. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. you'll probably know by the time this episode goes live. Um, the reason I did it initially was I really wanted, there's a couple of reasons. One, I really wanted to be able to offer a bunch of different tiers, not just like, hey, get a hardback book plus an ebook version, you mm-hmm. know, or a hardback plus audio. I was like, I want it. Like I never do. I don't take money for one-on-one calls. I just don't do consulting. I don't have time. And I get asked a lot. So mm-hmm. I was like, this is the time to do it. So hmm. I think I have a tier. It's like somewhere in the $800 range. And it's like, you get the hardback book, you get an hour of my time or 45 minutes or so. You know, it's like, this mm-hmm. is it. If people want to do it, let's do it. I have like an in-person founder retreat. It's like max four or five people come to Minneapolis this summer. And it's, you know, like five grand in that range. And it's like, you know what? Maybe no one will back that. But if they do, that'll be cool. And mm-hmm. then there's a live Q&A and a one-on-one Q&A. These would be weird on a landing page. If I went to Shopify or I built yeah. a WordPress yeah, landing page and I put them all, and I'm like, here you go. Here's nine different options to buy this book. You'd be like, are you out of your mind? But you go to a Kickstarter and guess what? You expect it. Yeah, that's, that's how true. Kickstarter works. It's it's built in. So that was the first thing is I was really excited to like have a bunch of tears, right? For with With reason. Um, the second thing is... I've never done a hardback book and to do hardcovers, hmm. print on demand is like $50 a copy or some stupid amount. So like to do hardbacks, you print in a huge offset fashion. So you need to order thousands of them at a time. Hmm. And so what do you want to do? Well, you want to take pre-orders for that, right? You want to get interest because you don't want to print 5,000 and sell one. So I am viewing this as a kind of a pre-order thing. And to just have people pay via Stripe and then you don't ship for six months, that's not good. Mm-hmm. You're not supposed to do that actually, right? So hmm. Kickstarter, it works to... If I know, I'm going to know if there's 3,500 of these I need, then I'm going to get them for four bucks a piece, you know, instead of the $50 a piece, right? So there's a certain element of like maybe a pride thing, but also I want this on people's, like I paid a, a lot of money for the the cover design. He's a professional mm-hmm. designer who's done a bunch of books that we've heard of, like James Clear's book and um, Michael, Lewis, uh, Michael Lewis book. Mm-hmm. This is, I want this to look really good on people's mm-hmm. shelves. You know what I mean? And the hardback yeah. just looks better. So that was kind of the second reason was to be able to have pre-orders. And then the third reason is maybe more about me, but I view Kickstarter as it's an audience, it's a community, it is kind of a social network in a way. Like I've backed almost 300 Kickstarters and I'm linked to like 50 other people and when they back, I see what they back. I have no, it's like the one social network aside from maybe TikTok and Pinterest, I guess, (laughs) that like I'm not, that I haven't put content into. You know what I mean? Like I've built a following on YouTube, built a following on Twitter, built a following in podcasting, but you know, but like, I'm just curious, again, back to the learning. I'm really fascinated to see, like, can we, ex- can I expand my audience? And what I've heard is, yeah, there's a certain portion of the, of the, even with a nonfiction book, a certain portion of your backers are going to be brand new to you, you know? And whether that number is 10% or 20% or whatever, to me, that's a win. If I get hundreds or, you know, maybe thousands, I don't know, of people who hear about it and then become fans of what we're doing with microconf tiny seed and and the other stuff. Yeah. You know, I'd love to hear you mentioned this briefly in in the book itself, but it, you know, it sounds like there there was this period of time, I think it was a little while after you sold Drip where you know, you talked about uh being burned out and how and I want to talk more about burnout later in this conversation, but you know, you talked about maybe you were going to go a very different way. You weren't going to do the startup thing anymore. <laughs> I would love to hear you unpack that a little bit because I think a lot of people, certainly over the last few years of the pandemic and the, you know, the great resignation or the great reflection or whatever you want to call it, like people are rethinking their lives and what, you know, what they do with their lives. And I, I would just love to hear you unpack that a little bit in your, your thought process around, do I want to keep doing this? And cause I could, you know, I, I will yeah. say like I've been following your work for, I don't know, a decade or something. Like I, I remember getting your first book way back when and one of the things that I find just super impressive as somebody else who creates content is like your, your ability to just keep going and keep finding new things to say. Whereas like, cause that's sometimes, I don't know, I, I'll say in my own experience, sometimes I'm not sure what I want to say and I have to go figure it out. And so it's, I just think it's really impressive the, the longevity and the arc you've had. So I'd love to hear you unpack that a little bit of like, how did you think through that process? Yeah. You know, man, that's, it's a really good question because it was a tough time. I had a tough two, three years there with burnout, with this hard decision, this one-way door of, do I sell this company? Once you sell the company, company's gone. It's a bit, it's the fastest growing, most successful, I guess, in all, a lot of measures thing that I ever did. Mm-hmm. I, I, certainly I had did to that date. Do I sell this company? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then the feeling of I let once I sold it, it was like huge relief. I can retire. This is amazing. More money than I need. Love it. And I went, I worked there for another 18 months and then I left. And it took, I said, I, I'm not going to work for six months because I know what I'm going to do naturally is I've just mm-hmm. worked my whole life. I'm going to fall back into it. So I said, I'm going to take six months off. And I did a massive amount of reflection. I did a really long founder retreat where I went out on my own for three days because I have wife and kids here and it's the day-to-day stuff. It happens, right? So I went to a cabin north shore of, um, of Lake Superior here in Minnesota. And I just thought and I wrote. And I actually went through a bunch of questions. My wife, Dr. Sherry Walling, has a book called The Zen Founder Guide to Founder Retreats. And it's like a, it's an ebook. It's like 30, 40 pages, but it's a bunch of questions and reflection. And it's a discipline that she taught me. And during that time, I was like, I'm kind of burned out on startups. And I've been, you know, I started like blogging or writing essays about entrepreneurship and startups in 2005. So this was 2018. So I'm 13 years in. I have built a bunch of startups. I've sold several. I've mentored and advised and written books and, you know, just all, as you said, podcasts, all the stuff I've been Mm -hmm. thinking and and breathing and listening to books and listening to podcasts for so much time. And at that point I I couldn't do it anymore. So I had to like deleted my whole podcast feed and was just like, I'm only going to listen to Dungeons and Dragons Mm. podcast. I can't, I can't do business (laughs) content anymore. Right. Yeah. I stopped listening to business books around that time. I I listened to them again now, but it was obvious. I was just, I had done it for too long and I needed a sabbatical almost, you know, Mm -hmm. how like, as a professor or sometimes at larger companies, like eh, every six years, you get a sabbatical for three months. Yeah. That's what I needed was a break from thinking about it because it was burned out on even the thought process. So that's when I went and started talking to the guy who runs the number two tabletop gaming website in the world. Tabletop games are like more sophisticated. You know, it's not Monopoly. It's more like Settlers of Catan or Dungeons mm-hmm. and Dragons, you know, yeah. more complicated games. And I started talking to him about buying it. And I we around that time, we got a cash offer for Microsoft. And a seven figure offer. And I was like, it's not that I need the money, but it sure would be nice to yeah. walk away, to take half of that and walk away, add that to the, you know, the coffer that I have and basically never have to think about this stuff again. But here's the thing. There's this phrase I like. It's, I kept thinking, is this a permanent solution to a temporary problem? Mm. Cause if I sold microconf and I sold the podcast, whether I would have done that or shut it down, you don't, you don't go back and rebuild mm. that. I wouldn't. Right. Mm-hmm. These are things I had been building for, you know, a decade or more. And that's why I just gave it time. Don't mm-hmm. be impulsive. Right. That's what I was telling myself. So in the end, I realized I kind of had this re, as I started to, the burnout started to fade. I realized I've been thinking about entrepreneurship since I was a teenager. I've been writing about it, you know, since 2005. So now almost 20 years. I've been blog or podcasting about it now for almost 13. I've had this community for 13 years, micro. And I realized this is my life's work. Like This is actually my legacy. I kept thinking other things I'd done before, oh, my books and this and that. It's not. It's the whole kind of sharing my journey and trying to educate people and trying to help people and being an entrepreneur and loving it and then like encouraging encouraging others to do it too, right? And that was the moment that I realized, oh, my mission in life actually is this, it, which is to continue the thread, right? That's when I decided I need to do something additional. I have microconf, I have the podcast. What's the next thing? And that's when Tiny Seed came out Mm. and it was like, well, now for the bootstrappers who maybe want to raise a bit of funding, but don't want the kind of venture, whatever you call it, the the strings attached or whatever, you know, the venture path. It's, it's yet another thing. So I, that was the moment I was like, I'm keeping these, I'm leaning in even further. And that's when I revamped, like the podcast got completely revamped. Microconf, we doubled down on, well, we were an event at that point and we became an online community. That's when we started the YouTube channel. That's when we started mastermind matching, you know, all this stuff, like doubled and tripled down into to kind of build it into what it is today. I really appreciate you sharing that story because I think it's it's those kind of um, moments in in your journey that really are the key ones that people don't often hear about. So I first of all really appreciate you just sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, and, and I can I can resonate with some some parts of it, and and I think a lot of the people listening uh, can as well. I mean, I, I took a sabbatical last year. Like I burned out about a year ago and ended up taking six seven months off last year and doing you know kind of walking away from it all and kind of going through my own similar journey, like you're describing, sort of different contexts, but same, same basic things where I just had to put it all down. And, and I think the, the, the path back is its own interesting thing that is very much not discussed. So I really appreciate you sharing that. You mentioned you had this moment of realization where you're like, oh, wait a second, this thing I was about to walk away from, this is actually, as best I understand it, my life's work. How do you conceive of that now? Like, do you, do you have a, 
a, a way you language that for yourself of like, oh, what I'm trying to do is X. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mission, right? And I've always, I never do the mission, vision, value stuff because I right, hated right. it at the companies I worked at. <laughs> but my mission is to multiply the number of independent self-sustaining startups in the world. And that's it. And it, it happens to be SaaS because I know it and I like it. And there's a bunch of benefits of that business model. But it's not SaaS. I want, I believe in entrepreneurship as a great equalizer. I boosted, I was a construction worker. My first job, I made 450 an hour. I held a shovel next to a, a, you know, a tractor as we laid pipe for, you know, got rained on. Like I remember this mm -hmm. sucks. And I had learned to write software I, I, as a kid. And then I started writing Perl. I went to the library and checked out books on P Perl and HTML. I taught myself that. I got a day job coding. You know, this is 25 years ago, 23 years ago now. Then I started products. Then I started this and that. It changed my life. It is a great equalizer, especially bootstrapping, because you don't need permission from anyone to do it. You just need to solve a problem, right? And that's just is a, is a word because it's hard. It, I'm not saying it's not hard. But what I'm saying is, like, I believe in entrepreneurship as this massive equalizing force in our world. And I don't want to get philosophical about it, but that's why I view it. No matter what, I could build five more SaaS companies and they would could solve whatever problems. And that's fine. And they would be worth a bunch of money. That's not as valuable to me at this point as changing people's lives, I guess. Like, I, again, yeah. I, I feel weird. I mean, like, I'm being grandiose or something. But, like, people will write me and be like, I listened to your podcast for a decade and it absolutely changed my life. I, similar story to mine, like, it pulled me up, you know, out of poverty or it pulled me up out of depression or whatever. And now I, I just had an exit. Someone wrote me and said, like, I just exited for $8 million. We live mm. in Canada. Like, my whole family is going to, I can live for the rest of my life. And I would never have done it if I hadn't heard your, your podcast. And it's like, that's wow. the shit that means, yeah, tell me about it. I mean, I read that stuff. I get teary eyed. Like, it's a huge deal to me. And I'm like, yeah, that's worth more to me than me building another startup, you know, oh, God, any yeah. of those. And so that's where, that's where it is for me, right? Is like, that's the mission. And if you look at anything I do now, it's that, including writing a book, you know, like this is a, yeah, it's 30 bucks to buy this, but like, I'm not doing the book for the money. Yeah, I'm doing the book to spread the info. I want people to have this in their heads so that their journey is just a little bit easier, you know? And that's what the podcast is, right? You have a podcast. We give it away for free. I spend a thousand bucks a month on an editor and a producer, well, maybe 1500 Our YouTube channel, we spend several thousand dollars a month, all free. And you could say, well, it's to build an audience so you can monetize it. I mean, if you look at MicroConf, it's not like we charge that much. Like, yeah. we, we, you know what I mean? We're not building totally. some... $30,000 a year coaching platform. Like we're not minting money. It, it truly is. It has to be sustainable. It has to be profitable, right? Tiny seed of microphone. But these are not, not doing it to make millions of dollars. It's, it, that would be nice and it would justify my time. But really a lot, most of the stuff we do, we kind of give away, do it at cost, make a little bit of profit so we can pay salaries. And that's, I think that's where I am. No, I love it. I actually, I really appreciate you sharing and touching into the philosophical because I think it's so easy. Like, there's so there's so many there's just so many like bullshit tropes around these sorts of things in the world of technology and building startups like you know we've all seen the really annoying you know broy founder on stage at TechCrunch like I'm going to change the world by blah, blah you know that kind of thing and, and so what I what I really appreciate it because I am consider myself as someone who has a similar philosophical stance where I I like these things and believe in these things because they are vehicles that can change the arc of people's lives and help them put into the world what they want to put into the world. Right. And, and that I think is amazing. That's like why I like technology in the first place. And so anyways, I really appreciate you sharing that. And it's also just for the listener, like a really good example of kind of this mapping of like, oh, I have this higher level, you know, intention and how might I, what are the different ways that that can flow into the world through, you know, discrete, concrete offerings that are aligned with it? That's right. And as a listener, you don't have to have that right now. I didn't have, you know, what I'm saying, this whole lot, the mission, all that, that was Five years ago, I was in I was in my early 40s. I was 20 years into an entrepreneurial journey. I had a bunch of bumps, scrapes, and bruises, a bunch of knowledge, a bunch of losses. And that's when I found it. It found me at the right time. So if you're 32, listen to this and be like, oh, no, I don't have my life's purpose. Like, I didn't either. So don't rush it. And don't feel like you need it now. Just keep grinding. Like, keep doing what you're doing. You're going to learn the stuff. And it will hopefully become clear. I can't promise anything. But like, if you keep following that, Eventually, something, you know, I think something, uh, something will come to you. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's the willingness to ask the question and then stay in the game long enough to find the answer is is basically the only guarantee there is. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to shift gears a little bit here. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the specific content in the book. And and for the listener, I've read the book. It's excellent. It will literally shave years off your learning curve and, uh, you know, preserve your hairline or whatever I was going to say. Like, you know, <laughs> basically keep you from losing oh, hair or like uh, getting gray hair. Like, but point is, there's some do, bumps and bruises yeah, in do the book a for favor. sure. <laughs> yeah. So like, I'm curious, what is, you know, there's, there's so much advice out there on the internet, right? And, and I'm sure going through your process of writing this book, as you said, like there was another book literally that you got that cut out of this one just to come down to this. How did you decide? You know, there's there's six key things in the book, sort of key six key sections. Um, how did you pick these, and and why not the other ones? Really good question. Actually, it was not a top down approach where I was like, people need to learn about market, and people need to learn about pricing and marketing, right? And, right, high, right. and building your team. Like those are four of them. It actually started bottom up, where I at a certain point, five six years ago, every question I answered in writing anywhere that I felt was was generalizable, I started throwing into a Google Doc. So I would go into these private Slack groups. I'd go in Tiny Seed Slack, MicroConf Connect Slack. People would ask a question and I would weigh in with, you know, 200 words or 1200 words. Like I'd write a whole essay. I'd pull that, throw it in. Indie hackers, Quora, like anything I did, if I wrote an essay, if I, you know, just on and on and on, even some podcast episodes I recorded, I was like, you know what? That should be in a book at some point. Mm -hmm. So then when I went into the, to the Google Doc, I had a bunch of stuff that was really detailed. I mean, there were questions like, I'm a solo founder. Should I find a co-founder? Mm -hmm. um, how do I, I kept getting, how do I market my startup? Like that alone, I was like, that's a chapter, right? Or a huge section. Like, how do you totally. decide, right? I need a framework for that. So that's where it started. And in fact, I had about 75, 80% of those topics that are in the book I had in that Google Doc. And I started cranking it out. By the time the, the writer, the coach came in, she was like, you have stuff, but it's just all over the place. How do we start grouping these into headings, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's where it was like, oh, there's, you know, there's a bunch of stuff about team and hiring and firing and managing. And that, like, that should be under one thing, whatever we call it. I think we called it team. But that's where it came from. So we really just rolled it up. Got mostly done with the writing, even though some of the writing was, I would like go to one of my podcast episodes, just literally pull the transcript and throw it in there. So you can't, that's not writing, right? But at least the content was there. And then I shared it with like 10 of my pretty knowledgeable founders, who advisor, I'm sorry, founders that I advise or am invested in. And I said, what topics am I not covering mm. for a book like this? You know, given that it's like how to build a SaaS to multi-millions dollar, multi-millions of dollars without venture capital, what am I missing? And turns out I was miss I was missing sales. I didn't talk about much about, I think, onboarding. And I actually didn't talk a lot about talking to your customers, like customer interviews, right, right, both for fine product. But like, there were just some areas that I had completely missed. I don't know why. So then, so that was the second feedback loop, right? Is first, it was a bunch of little things, and then it was a writer organizing them, and then it was a, you know, a writing coach organizing them, and then it was some knowledgeable founders who weighed in. By the time I got there, I was like, okay, that's the whole book. And yep. now how do I make it, you know, compact and palatable? Uh, and all that. And I think that's a way better way. I think that's, at least for me, that's the right process. Because if I start top down, I start a little lofty. I become an astronaut, you know, and I'm like, well, people should know about this. And then you mm -hmm. get down and you're like, well, there's actually no meat here, but hey, I'll be like every other business book and just have 50 page anecdotes <laughs> about into it. You know, that's some, some ghostwriter wrote that nobody cares about, right? I didn't want it to be that. I want it to be this very compact uh, tome. Yeah. Yeah. I want to zoom in a little bit on, on two specific sections. So the, the two that I want to zoom in on, and, and of course, like, again, reader, there is so much packed into this book. I just sort of my head was starting to hurt from nodding so hard as I went through it. So just do yourself a favor, go get it. But I want to zoom in a little bit on specifically first on uh, markets um, and secondly on marketing, uh, because obviously there's a huge relationship between those two. But those are, I think, the two areas that when I think about the the founders and product leaders that I, I spend the most time with in private conversation, that's like where the most of the, the thrashing goes on here. I think where I want to tee you up here on the market side of things is choosing your market. Because as I've heard you and others like, you know, Justin Jackson and so forth talk about like your market, especially in a bootstrap SaaS, is probably the single biggest factor that's going to determine your trajectory. So talk to me a little bit about choosing the market and then we'll see where that takes us. Yeah. And it's it's tough because 
see, I've, entrepreneurship is such a journey that like your first startup, your first effort, I don't know that you should care that much about the market. I think you should maximize for learning and the likelihood of a single, you know, I'm meaning a single, like a, in a baseball metaphor of, can mm-hmm. I get to 5k a month? Yeah. That's an amazing goal, right? If you enter a market like marketing automation, CRM, ERP, and we could name some other big markets as a first time founder with no boot, no funding, the odds are stacked against you and you're more likely to just crash and burn and not learn very much because it's just too hard, right? So mm-hmm. that's where I want to caveat it of like, look, me now where I am, I would pick big markets with a ton of competitors, usually that have really high prices and people hate them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what I would do. Right. But don't do that. Don't do that if you're, if you're a first time founder. Like pick a step one business. Like uh, I have the stair step approach to bootstrapping where it's like mm-hmm. step one is just a smaller business. It's less ambitious, but you're going to, l- you're going to learn so much experience around copywriting and support and shipping something and just how to do all of this. Right. And usually they're in these ecosystems, like it's a Shopify add on a Heroku add on a WordPress plugin, you know, some type of add on to an ecosystem. The reason there is you can then draft off of their traffic. You don't need to learn marketing, which is maybe, you know, I know you're calling out market and marketing. It's because marketing is really hard. It's one of the mm-hmm. hardest things. Like as a, whether I'm a developer or not, I can hire someone to build a product. Building the product is usually the least risky part of the endeavor. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like yep. now we can argue, well, but building a really good product with really good UX, really good UI. Yes, that is hard. And knowing exactly what to build in a new spec. Yes, that is hard. But all things considered, the market risk is far outweighs just the ability to execute and build product. Yeah, you know? yeah. Think about it in like product product management terms, which is what most of the, this audience is very familiar with, right? Like most of the kinds of businesses we're talking about here have far more market risk than feasibility risk, right? It's not a question of can you build it? It's a question of should you. Yeah. Right. Right. And so um, back to your question, which was choosing your market. I see. I start with problems. Mm-hmm. That's really where I think people should start is... If someone doesn't, if, because I'm a SaaS founder, right? It's like SaaS should solve a problem. We don't do B2C SaaS. It's all B2B. Solve a problem for a business. Solve a problem people are willing to pay for. So then you can say, okay, cool. Well, I came up with 10 problems, whether they're my own, whether they're my spouses, my uncles, or just I went out on the internet and people on Quora or Facebook mm-hmm. groups said they have this problem, right? I have 10 problems. Now you you can take market into account. I have something called the 5 p.m. idea evaluation framework. Just Google it. Is I have a whole podcast episode with a transcript about it. And there's five P's and one M in the framework. That's why it's called that. And it's like price sensitivity, pain to validate. And I think the M is market. And it's one of the five of the six factors. So I don't view market as like the number one factor, but I do view it as one of six, you know, one of six things to think about. Can you build, let's say a $5 million SaaS company in a, you know, several billion dollar super crowded market? Absolutely. Can you build a $5 million SaaS company that's probably worth just as much as the other one in like a tiny little $50 million market? Absolutely. You can bootstrap that too. I've seen it done. So yes, market has an impact, but it's, you know, and and again, going into a tiny, tiny market and I want to build a $5 million, you know, a $2 million market, I want to build a $5 million, that's not going to happen. But it has an impact, but I do view it as just one of many factors. Yeah, what one of the things that I hear a lot, and I've I've certainly bumped up against this uh, myself, you know, and and the context I want to set here is many of the people, many of the listeners of this show are really talented product people, right? They are they're already used to this way of thinking. They're used to building and shipping and and thinking in a lot of these ways, um, you know, which is why product is is you know generally speaking a pretty good founder set of, set of founder training wheels. Um, but they're usually working in, let's say, not in an indie context. Maybe they're at a, a big company or they're at like a, a funded growth stage company. But a lot of them, you know, aspire in the direction that, you know, in the tiny seed direction, in, in the direction we're talking about here. How much do they need to, with people who have a good set of skills and ways of thinking already, how much do they need to, A, go through the whole stair step thing? Like, do they need to start at step one and build a tiny thing? Or if they have, if they already have good SaaS skills, but they haven't done it on their own, do they need to, trying to start at step one. That's that's my first question. And then my second question, thinking about, you know, in your 5 p.m. framework, uh, one of those is like product founder fit. And I'm curious, like what the level of, I guess I'll say, like the level of personal passion for the problem needs to be. Like some mm-hmm. people really care about a certain problem for whatever set of reasons. How much is mm-hmm. that a thing versus like, 
you know, it's a real problem and you'll get passionate about it as you work on it. I'm going to start with the second question first. If you're going to build a great little lifestyle step one business, 5K, 10K, 20, 30K a month, I don't think you need to be passionate about the problem. At least I didn't need to. And I built a bunch of those. By the time you're in it and you're like, I'm going to grow a team and I'm going to build a five, three, $10 million SaaS company or any type of company, uh, I'd have a tough time not being passionate about it. I would, I would burn out and be unhappy, basically. Mm. Even It's interesting. I wasn't excited about marketing automation, but I was excited about the potential of email marketing. Not even the potential. I had every product I had started before that, including my conference, books, software products, community, podcasts. Email had made a huge difference for me, building email lists. I used MailChimp and, and Aweber and Campaign Monitor. And it was like, those were level ups for me, like cheat mm-hmm. codes. And so I was super pumped on being able to do that for other people. So by the time we were building Drip and then when it became marketing automation, it was like, ah, I'm not that excited about that in particular, but still I believe in the value of email and it was cool to do it, right? So mm-hmm. that's a level. I think if you really don't want to do it, if it's like, I'm going to build a $5 SaaS for like mortuaries, you know, and embalmers and it's like, I wouldn't enjoy that, but maybe someone would. And so I think you're going to want to, you know, really be into that in order to do it. Your first question was, if you're a product person and you have some experience, SaaS experience already, uh, you know, should you do step one or not? I don't think it's clear cut. And I'll say it depends, but then you have my thought process there. The idea of a step one business is that you learn a bunch of the ropes that you may not know even as a product person. Um, Mm -hmm. And maybe you do, but like, do you know how to like write marketing copy? I don't mean documentation, but I mean like really being able to communicate the the benefits and the features and the values. Um, Do you know how to write code or you can manage a developer to to turn it? It's not just, hey, we should build these features, but it's like shipping software and fixing bugs and shipping high quality software is is hard. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not easy even in step one business. Step one gives you experience in those areas, also gives you some revenue. That's the other thing is like starting with a full blown SaaS or a standalone SaaS, as I, as I call it these days, like give yourself, I mean, to get to launch nights and weekends as a developer, you're probably talking a year nights and weekends, you know, and then mm-hmm. product market fits another 12 to 18 months. If you're doing it well, it took me 12 to 18 months to find product market fit and I knew what I was doing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's where it's like, look, if you have that much runway or that much nights and weekends or that much money in the bank that you can go full time, then cool. If you don't step one business is that great way to do it on the side to learn enough. And then you get that step one business and you can kind of autopilot step one businesses. And even if let's say you get a first step one business to grand a month, Shopify add on two grand a month. Then you do another one, then you do another one. And I've seen tons of people do this. I did this myself. And you get that up to 10 grand a month. You get three of them. Now you buy out your own time. Mm-hmm. You, do, you have infinite runway. Mm-hmm. And that's a real luxury. You know, that now that may take you a year to get to or two years, but a year or two to get to infinite runway with a, with a decent likelihood it'll work. Now the SaaS stuff is like, well, I just need to do that again on a bigger scale, but I have forever to figure it out, you know, mm-hmm. and I have more mm-hmm. experience. And I'm not under the, the the under the gun. Step one are the small businesses. Step two is once you buy out your time. And then step three is standalone SaaS. I'm not saying you should always do that because there are absolutely a bunch of people in Tiny Seed or in MicroConf, you know, that start with the SaaS app and they figure it out. Usually it's their third, fourth, or fifth that we're funding with Tiny Seed because they've just been boom, boom, you know, face planting as most of us do the first few times. Mm-hmm. So it really is that trade off, you know, of like, do I want to try to, play in the major leagues from the start because i have some skills i'm not a major league player but i'm i'm pretty good or do i want to go back it's like i'm better than high school but i'm going to go back i'm going to play high school ball then i'm going to play college ball then i'm going to play single a double a and then get to majors you know it's like how long how long are you willing to wait and i think there's a higher likelihood you'll succeed if you stair step but it's not zero if you don't it's i think it's lower but it, you could potentially get there faster so i think about it yeah no it makes a lot of sense and i, I think as i'm as i'm just listening to you as you're saying that, it sounds like one of the real issues that's going to come up for people to name it this bluntly is probably ego, right? And it's a sense of like, yeah. but wait, I'm this, you know, I lead product or I build software for this really hot shot company. Why would I go back to building some dinky little Fi add on? I feel like it's much, probably much more of an ego challenge than and an emotional challenge than like a practical one. I think you're right. Hmm. Have, have you seen anything help people move through that? Like, I don't know what, even how you would do that, but I, I've seen, I, I recognize the the block, but I'm not sure what to do about it. I think once you, if if you 
see other people failing or succeeding. Like you see people failing starting SaaS apps, like go to Indie Hackers and watch how many people plateau at like $800 a month mm. trying to do a SaaS app and it just goes forever. Like that's can be a wake up call for you is like getting the actual numbers. I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying a bunch of Indie Hackers is the issue. I'm just saying they have public data and you'll see people posting. If you look at the broader startup ecosystem and you see the numbers that I see, most people trying to start these apps don't succeed. They don't hit their goals. And their goal is usually to quit their day job. And sometimes it's to have a multi-million dollar exit. And most people never get to launch or they get to launch and it's crickets or they get to launch and it's $800 a month. And they've spent a year of their nights and weekends and they never get past that. And having that realization of like, that's the most likely outcome for you. Actually, mm-hmm. I mean, it's a little bleak, but if you do it this way, like that's probably what's going to happen just based on the numbers. Mm-hmm. Now, you probably have some more skills and more experience, you know, that'll weigh the, you know, weigh it in your favor. But I think having a reality check on that, I think without that reality check, like without listening to your podcast, my podcast, just kind of being in ecosystems or in communities, you you kind of feel if you just read TechCrunch that mm-hmm. everybody succeeds and everyone's <laughs> crushing it all the time, right? right. And yeah. get that Good out of your head. survivorship I bias. Think, yeah. And that's not helpful. It's not healthy. And it's not helpful to to give founders a like a reality check of how it actually is. And so that's probably where I'd start is just get real data or get some real insights from people who do have a view, you know, uh, that's broader than just the person next to me. It's, you know, maybe I someone who sees a 1000 or 10,000 startups and can really give you more insight. I really appreciate that. One of the things that I noticed just reflecting on my own journey is sort of two things. Number one is just realizing how biased the the data that we've all taken in over the previous whatever decade, 15 years is. Like the the startup media complex is substantial. And you know, there's this we we just forget like and you even call this out in your book, right? Like there is a whole spectrum of funding options and and I kind of personally think that every business sort of has like a natural scale or like a right size to it. And so many of the failures that we see, like not just in the company failing, but destroying the people who are in it and just leaving them with you yeah. know, horrendous scars are where someone for a very variety of reasons has tried to turn like a nice $30 million business into like a VC rocket ship. And it's like, this would have been an awesome $30 million business. And like, trust me, if you own a $30 million business, your life, you're in a great life. <laughs> like it's going to be yeah. good. Especially yeah, the margins and the exit multiples on that. If I, yeah, no, that is a life changing sum of money. I mean, that's a nine figure exit. And that you're right. The, the businesses that overextend themselves or try to fit the mold of VC has just never made sense to me. I've never been anti venture capital either. Yeah. I am, I am a venture capitalist today. I hate saying that. That feels weird because I still feel my, I'm a founder and I'm someone who supports founders. But yes, I run a $42 million venture fund. And yet venture capital is a tool. It's like there are people who are like never use venture capital is the worst thing. And it's like that's like saying never use hammers. Yeah, like hammers why? a tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah a hammer sense. is good for nailing a nail in. It's not good for, you know, whatever, finishing my wall. It'll break a hole in it. Venture capital is the same way. But the problem is people don't understand that. And they think it's the only way. Oh, so many people, right? Fed by TechCrunch, Mashable, VentureBeat, whatever. And the VCs themselves. that it's the only way to do something in the world that matters. And that is just abjectly false. Yeah, 100%. I mean literally the show the name of the show is make things that matter and and so it should be unsurprising that this is a a thing that is brought up in the show is like thinking about what matters and more specifically like what matters to you and your life um and i want to actually offer one other suggestion from my own uh my own journey because like i i'm speaking from personal experience of like going through the weird long process of extricating my psychology from that uh, let's just say the startup industrial media complex um, and I just want to strongly endorse working with somebody, whether that's a coach, a therapist, a, a, a counselor, whatever. Like I've worked with a number of those over the years, including your wife, Sherry, who was amazing. And it was massively impactful. And, and, um, I just can't think of anything like that's a higher, higher impact, higher ROI spend for your own psychology. So I just want to like throw that out there for people. If this is something you resonate with and you see this in yourself, I really hope you consider doing something like that, or at least trying it. I agree. It's good advice. Yeah. All right. Well, Rob, this has been fantastic. What would you like to leave the listener with? And how can listeners of this be helpful to you? Let's think. The book is at sasplaybook.com. And that's where they can get a link to the Kickstarter. Or if even if this is a month or two after the Kickstarter, you can enter your email. And then, you know, when did you have books available, can, can get one to you. Also, if you listen to this podcast, you're probably going to like mine. It's called Startups for the Rest of Us. 
it's a little more focused on SaaS and I focus on SaaS because it's what I know. But honestly, every episode has something that's just entrepreneurial. You know, it's just about building and it's about building a great life. It's about freedom, purpose and relationships. It's about uh, building great things while you have, you know, a family and um, want to change. You don't want to change the world. You just want to change your little corner of it. That's what I often say. I think that's what I'll leave people with as well. I love it. Well, Rob, thanks again for being here. Great to have you back and excited for the new book. So cheers. Thanks, Ben. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, I'd be so grateful if you could do me a favor and take about 25 seconds to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That helps me reach way more listeners, and it also helps me bring you more great guests. As always, please feel free to reach out to me anytime at connect at makethingsthatmatter.com. And until next time, my friends, leave them better than you found them. See you out there.